Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome New York Times op-ed columnist, Frank Bruni. I think 10 hours was kind. The, debel the debate felt more like 20 hours to me. Um, about a year and a half ago, uh, I had the privilege of teaching a writing seminar at Princeton, one of our most renowned schools, anointed number one yet again in the recent U.S. News and World Report rankings, which came out just last week. The seminar was limited to 16 students, and because of the topic, food writing, it was predictably oversubscribed. So students who'd expressed an interest were asked to write letters explaining why and a little bit about themselves and showing me a little bit about their way with words. 48 students took the trouble to do that. These letters were terrific. They were animated, they were charming. As I read through them, I felt growing excitement and then dawning regret because I didn't know how I was gonna choose 16. In the end, I did because I had to. And the semester began and gradually my excitement was replaced by confusion because I began to realize that most of the students weren't writing anything for the class that was as good, that had as much verve and polish as what they'd written to argue for a spot in it. I mentioned this to one Princeton professor after another. Nobody was surprised. Each professor said some version of the following. In this era of 10% and 8% acceptance rates, these kids are at Princeton with its 7.4% acceptance rate because they're expert at applying to things. They focus their energy on that. They've been coached to focus their energy on that. What the frenzied admissions race has taught them is that getting into things, breaching an exclusive sanctum, whether it's a school or a cool sounding writing seminar, is the chief goal and the main accomplishment. And all the dividends flow from that. Just muscle your way through the door and don't worry as much about what happens on the other side in the room itself. Um, I tell that story not as a put down to Princeton because I think I could be telling a story from Harvard or Stanford or Georgetown or Northwestern. And I don't tell it as a put down to the students who were earnest and quite talented and I enjoyed very, very much. I tell it as a put down of all of us and our society and what we've created with this mad admissions race to get into a school as selective as one can get into. I could talk at length um, about the faulty thinking on which that race is predicated. I could also explode the myth that your life will be made or broken by the exclusiveness of the school you go to. But what I want to discuss today is consequences. The damage that we're doing, the strange values that we're teaching, and the warped messages that we're sending. There's a school in the Silicon Valley that a few years ago decided it had to take bold steps to address the sleep problem among students there. It brought in outside sleep experts. It developed a whole sleep curriculum. It trained students as sleep ambassadors, and it even held a contest among students for the best sleep slogan. The winner, life is lousy when you're drowsy. <laughs> and these kids were drowsy because they either weren't able to get enough sleep or they weren't letting themselves get sleep as they chased perfect test scores and perfect grades, all in the service of perfect transcripts, which they saw as a prerequisite to getting into an elite school. And of course, getting into an elite school was worth whatever it took, whatever it takes. An Ivy League professor described for me a visit he got not long ago from some relatives who were visiting the campus. It was mom, dad, and daughter, and as they sat in his office, they were clearly hoping to impress him and thinking maybe when they left, he'd pick up the phone or type out an email to admissions and say, we have to have this young woman at our school. So mom and dad kept prompting their daughter, tell him about your grades, tell him about your activities. At a certain point, panic set in, and the professor could tell that they were worried they hadn't rummaged sufficiently through the treasure chest of her charms, that maybe they'd left one little bauble unretrieved. And at that moment, the mother turned to the daughter and said, don't forget to tell him that you were president of your high school's survivors of bulimia group, whatever it takes. Let me read to you the words of a junior in high school in Palo Alto. These were posted publicly on the internet. And of course, Palo Alto 
is the home to Stanford with its unprecedented 5.0% acceptance rate. She wrote this, as I sit in my room staring at the list of colleges I've resolved to try to get into, trying to determine my odds of getting into each, I can't help but feel desolate. She admitted to panic attacks in class. She said that she'd missed menstrual cycles because of exhaustion. And she added this, we are not teenagers. We are lifeless bodies in a system that breeds competition, hatred, and discourages teamwork and genuine learning. In Palo Alto, there have been so many, in Palo Alto over recent years, so many teenagers have ended their lives by stepping in front of trains that when I visited the area last spring, I noticed at every major railroad cross crossing an orange vested safety worker, a sentry. These people were there every day and they were on a suicide watch. And of course, it's not just high schools. There have been rashes of suicides at MIT, at Cornell, at University of Pennsylvania, where six students committed suicide in a recent 13-month period. Now, of course, suicide is extreme and rare, and it's never so easily explained. But achievement-oriented students from privileged backgrounds are overwhelming campus mental health services. They're reporting unusual levels of anxiety and depression, and they're engaging in self-destructive behavior like binge drinking. And psychologists say that this reflects the panic they feel about falling shy of the markers that have been set for them. And of course, the ultimate marker is getting in to an Ivy League school or another school of its ilk. And as that becomes more and more difficult, almost impossible, these kids feel like they're being set up to fail. Something else I saw, <coughs> or rather learned at Princeton, um, there's an eating club there whose wildest, sloppiest, most beer-soaked party is called State Night. Do you know why it's called State Night? Because it's when you party as if you were at a state school. Some students will come dressed in a Rutgers jersey, others in a University of Maryland hoodie. Even, I'm told, something like a Dartmouth cap, because Dartmouth, with its 11.5% acceptance rate, might as well be a state school. The admissions race is reinforcing the idea that all of life is a hierarchy, that all of life is a pecking order, that all of life is brands, some of which flatter you more than others. We're turning higher education into a mall with tiered department stores. Bergdorf Goodman over there, Nordstrom right here, J.C. Penney down the way. Oh, and across the street there's a Walmart. Let's hope its customers are getting what they want. By lavishing so much attention on the strategy and the sorcery behind a successful college application, we're sending the message that packaging matters as much or more than substance, and even that deception is okay. And by telling kids to take this many AP courses, to participate in that many extracurriculars, to discover an obscure sport to excel at, to find an arcane charity to work for in the summer, we're, promoting the, we're, we're encouraging them to blindly follow a choreography that may have absolutely nothing to do with their passions. And we're promoting the idea that life yields to scripts. That's a lie. Some of the most dazzling people and some of the most extraordinary careers are the products of serendipity, spontaneity, experiment. But this lie can follow kids to college, and it can influence and constrict their experiences there. I recently asked the, the renowned psychologist Barry Schwartz, who's been teaching at Swarthmore for four decades, if he notices any difference in the students he gets these days, the ones who've been culled by this admissions race. He said that he does. This is what he told me. I think that these kids want to be given a clear and unambiguous path to success. They want a recipe, and that's the wrong thing to be wanting. Progress isn't made by recipe. Recipes create cooks. They don't produce chefs. And if we don't produce chefs at Swarthmore, where are we going to produce chefs? We're utterly perverting the point and the dignity of hard work and of learning. By framing both in merely practical terms, we're sucking the soul out of them. I recently asked a college counselor at a Southern California secondary school what she dreads most 
about admission season. She said she dreads a statement that she hears time and again from one disappointed student after another. The student will get responses from the 12 or 15 or 18 schools to which he or she applied. Some of the most coveted schools will say no, and the student will invariably respond with these words, I did all of this for nothing. The leadership role in a student group, that was for nothing. The lessons in biology and the natural order of this mesmerizing world of ours, that was for nothing. It's as if all of high school and all of college and all of education is merely a means to an end, a humdrum bridge to some imagined promised land, and not a journey all its own, a process of growth, and an act of betterment. I did all of this for nothing. We all have to think long and hard about how we purge those words and that resentment and that defeatism from the lives of kids who have nothing but promise ahead of them and who, should, who, are, and who are pivoting into what should be one of the grandest adventures of their lives. Thank you.